The Collective Whisper Podcast with Simon King. Okay, good evening, everybody, to uh, Collective Whisper, Get to Know. And this week on our show, we have Colm Farrell all the way from Tune. I'd like to welcome Colm, and he's now living in the UK since 2013. Today, Colm joins me via virtual link to tell us his story and his journey so far. Welcome, Colm. Simon, how are you? How's things? Good, good. How are you? How's everything over there? I I can't complain. It's lashing down. It's the rain all day long, so it is. <laughs> Is the weather bad there? It's just the same as been back in June. Never stops raining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You brought a bit of tune with you. I did, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> t- t- tell us, where exactly are you again? I'm in Warrington. It's um, up in the northwest of England. It's between um, Liverpool and Manchester. Bang in the middle. Ah, bang in the middle. And you've been you've been in Warrington since 2013? I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. Met a girl ah. there and didn't move since. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and how has it been, you know, living in the UK for the last seven years or so? How how has it been? Precious grand is no different than at home. I that's what the, well, the worst thing is obviously miss family. But I mean, like, the travel is so easy now, you know, you can go back and over on a regular basis. Well, not at the moment, obviously, with the COVID. But I mean, prior to this, you know, you go back and home every few weeks anyway. So it's great, you know. How is it different to Tume and Galway, Warrington? Is, is it a different kind of place? I suppose, but it's 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 bigger for the starters. But you know, like in Shum, like sure I know everybody in Shum, um, back in the day, you know, from been working in the in the pub business all my life, and sure you know every single person in the town, and they all know you as well. And the crack is different, you know. But I suppose I'm a, I'm a bit older now, a bit more sensible as well. Do you find now that you're in Warrington seventy seven years, that's starting to happen there too? You're starting to know everybody. Ah, uh, yeah, like there's, there's, there's a local Irish centre here in Warrington, and it's, it's it's probably one of the best Irish uh, centres in the UK. I think it's it's a very successful club, and I've got to know a lot of people down there, and um, you know, it's been very friendly down there as well. You know, ah, uh-huh. and is Warrington a big place? What kind of population does it have? It's got a population of over two hundred thousand people. Now it's got a very small town centre, but it's it's got a big residential area. You know, and it's got all the the, the big the big chains are all on the outskirts, but the town centre itself is. Basically, that must be in the Chum Town Centre, like, which seems a bit strange considering Chum has only got a population of like 9,000. Wow, wow. So, yeah, it's it's a kind of a, a suburb town, so everything's yeah, yeah. on the outskirts. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, and, you know, going back to 2013, um, what what was it that made like as you, I think you said there, you mentioned the word love, that famous word love. <laughs> was Was that kind of what brought you over there? Well, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was seeing a girl from over here. Anyway, she's a nurse here at the hospital, yeah. in Maria, and um, it, it kind of happened um, as a result of me um, having finished a couple of walks in Ar- in Ireland um, to raise awareness about suicide, and um, people in England were asking me to come over to the UK and do a walk here. So it's a bit of a long story, but we'll get to that eventually. How I ended up uh, coming over here on the walk, yeah. You know, because I, you, you, the the walks were like 2011. So, did you finish up long before you actually moved to the UK? Yeah, well, what happened was it was like back around 2008, nine. There was um, there was a lot of suicides in Chum, you know, and a lot of them would have been mm. obviously, as I said earlier, I know everybody in Chum. God, like there were some of them really good friends of mine, lads especially, you know. Yeah. And um, I said, what the fuck is going on here? Like, why are all these people taking their own lives? And um, I kind of I had the cellar bar in Chum at the time as well, you know. And um, I, I finished up there in the cellar in, in September 2010 and I had a bit more time on my hands, you know. And oh, for weeks and weeks and weeks and then even down to months right up until Christmas of that year, I couldn't get suicide out of my head. Now, I wasn't thinking about suicide, Simon, at all. But I, as in, I wasn't thinking of taking my own life. But I was, you know, there was something that was driving me to ask, why the hell? It was resting in the back of your head, this idea. Constantly. Yeah, yeah constantly. I was, just over the Christmas period then I was... I was saying to myself, like, what the hell, what the hell could one do to, um, to you know, to maybe um, raise awareness and, and try and get something done, you know, to try and maybe help people. And I um, wonder if it was actually Christmas, it was Christmas that year, 2010, we were at my mother's house for the Christmas dinner. And of course, it was the recession was at its, at its peak as well, I suppose. And I'll never forget my mother Kitty saying, 
she said during the Christmas dinner, she said, was no lights, she said, this two week is the start of the new year, she said, and I don't want any negativity coming into the house for the new year. And that just put it in my head, you know what, but I have to go and do something about this suicide crack. So mm. um, I got this crazy idea in my head then around February um, that maybe I could um, do a walk around Ireland because I wasn't working at the time anyway. And, um, you know, maybe just raise awareness about suicide. You know, I just start walking every county. And I was thinking, about where would I stage night or what would I do? And how would I, how, how would I put it all together, you know? And I, I just said, not to have it. So then I didn't know who would I do it for. Like, you know, you have to, if I was going to do this, I said, I might as well try and raise some funds for some charity as well, you know? But of course, I never heard of any charities that would have been helping, helping people that would have been suicidal. Um, so, of course, I start going online. Now, if you want to see me online, Simon, and that, you know, <laughs> the You're like a tech god. Pure, pure disaster. No, I mean, no, you won't get much worse. So I'm there and I'm typing in this suicide prevention. And um, so I just stumbled upon an article in one of the papers about Michal Murray Horty. And he had, okay. done, he, had done, he had done something down in Kerry, you know, it was a mountain walk or something, or I can't remember, and it was for Pieta House. I'm sure, I said, who the hell are these crowd? So I Googled them, and I discovered that they were based in um, in, in Lucan, in Dublin, and um, that's what to do, but like, they, they, they basically provide counselling for um, suicidal people. And um, I said, right, should I give them a ring? So I'll never forget, I rang up um, this theatre house anyway and a woman answered the phone and I said to her can I speak to the boss there and she said, <laughs> as you do yeah, she said who, who, who's the, who, who do you want to speak to I said I don't know I said who's the boss who's your boss so she said to me it was Joan Freeman and um, she said you have to make an appointment I said I haven't got any time I haven't got time to make an appointment I said can you just put her on the phone to me and she said you can't just do that like well I said it would be in her fucking interest I didn't say fucking but I said it was in her interest you know yeah. I yeah, yeah, speak yeah. To me, I said, because I have an idea that could raise some funds for the charity. They weren't long getting ready on the phone when they heard about funds. But yeah, that, that put a, that put a, a step in her. Yeah, yeah. So I did. She said, hold the line there for a minute, please. So I did. This woman come on the phone. So I told her my name is Hazard from Colin Farrell. And um, I said, I want to do a bit of fundraising for your charity. And she said, what do you propose to do? So I said, I'm going to walk through every county in Ireland. And all I heard was, are you daft or off your head? She said to me. <laughs> I said, no, I said, I'm serious. You, I said, I said, you said my my name is Hazard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I said, no, I'm actually very serious about this. And she said, when do you plan doing it? And I said, well, very soon. I said, because if I don't do it soon, I won't do it at all. So she said to me, um, God, she said, where do you live? So I told her in Chilmon County, Galway. She said, I come down and meet you. So she she came down the following Wednesday and met me at the Audrey House Hotel. And um, I said to her, this is my plan. I want to do this walk. And I said, I'd like to do it for you. And um, I, so she gave me a lot of information about what to do. So basically, I, then I mentioned it to my daughter and my two sons. And um, she was serious. She was, like, she was only 10 at the time. And I suppose she was kind of saying, what, what, what are you at like? You can't be just going off like that. But anyway, she, she, said, oh, she said, okay, so Dad, you can do it. And, um, so on the 7th of May, I, I said, I take off from Chum and I, I probably the plan was to walk maybe twenty miles a day and go up to say Galway into Mayo and um most common Sligo, Leach and Donegal and um cross it into Cavan and Langford and make my way around the country that way. But the idea was where was I going to stay each night? So I decided what I'd do is I try this. I said if if the first person I contact, if I ask them to try and get me accommodation within twenty miles, say, heading north. And then when I get to the next house, they probably know somebody twenty miles away, and so on. You know, so like 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 a chain. So the first place in there was was only a short walk. It was on the Sunday, the seventh of May, to um going to uh, Milltown. Now go down to call Sheridan's pub in Milltown. You know Sheridan's pub. Okay, 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 yeah, Sheridan's pub. Yeah, yeah, I do. Sure, I went to school with Carl. Says I know what Carl. Is. Carl, yeah. and, you know, get me started. So I rang Carl. I said, right, Carl, I'm doing this. I said, but will you organise my second day? He said, yeah, no problem. So the first day, anyway, it was actually a Saturday, sorry, we, we took off and we walked to Milltown. And Cahill had opened um, a new kind of place upstairs, you know, accommodation and all that. And um, so he put me up there, staying there. But she, the first night, in the ring of the lads in June, I came out to the pub. She weren't drinking till about four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> An initiation. Yeah, yeah. They wanted to basically just kind of mess me up before I started. <laughs> yeah. 
Second we'll send you on the road. Yeah. <laughs> I actually have to watch Clamorris the next day. I nearly croaked it. But anyway, we're doing it. And that was grand. And they organised the place for me in um, Kilkelly. I, I'm I'm sure it wasn't the the, fir- the last hangover walk he did on that trip. <laughs> it wasn't, no. As it turned out, it wasn't. No, <laughs> no. Um, but the whole thing was, and it, we got to Kilkelly, and then the guy in Kilkelly organised the place for me in Tubber Curry. So I went okay. to Tubber Curry on anyway, day number four, and I, I was... I went to this Murphy's hotel and there was a guy supposed to meet me there in it around four o'clock in the evening. And um, I was sure I was waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing happened. And I was ringing his number and there was nothing happening. And it was getting to around 10 o'clock at night. And I was saying, Jesus Christ, this is not looking good now. And I didn't bring a tent with me or anything. So I knew the fellow in the hotel behind the counter. I didn't know he was the owner of the hotel. And he came up to me and he said, he said, I'm not trying to pry now. He said, but he said, you seem like a man that's in a bit of bother. He said, you're on that phone a lot. He said, uh, so I told him the crack. And he said, listen, he said, I own the hotel. You can stay here tonight. So and, uh, I did. But as it turns out, the, the house I was supposed to stay was there was a sudden death in the house that day. And that's what happened. No. It was just unfortunate. And, and um, they weren't able to um, contact me. But they did, in all fairness, they came the next day to, to me. And they told me what happened and all that. But then it, it broke the chain. So I said, my next option is Facebook. I'd have to start putting things on Facebook now to say I'm looking for a plank, as I called it. So yeah. I started putting posts up on Facebook. And sure enough, we continued on walking in there for the next three months and we got a plank every single night. And we finished up Wow. We finished up in um, in Galway. You know, how long did you spend on Facebook every day trying to get a place? I'd put up a post each morning before I'd leave and then... I'd walk maybe ten miles and I'd have a look to see what's any reply. And more often than so, that, so you were do, you were doing it all on the mobile, or you going to internet cafes, or what? On the mobile, yeah, on the mobile, yeah, on the yeah. mobile, yeah. But well, John Stapleton and Shum, John Stapleton and Shum, actually, he sponsored me a, a lovely Samsung Galaxy tablet. Oh, it was lovely. So I was able Brilliant. to do do that, you know, and it was great. It made life a bit easier for me. But um, when I was down around Kerry, then I was maybe three quarters of the way into the walk, and um. I remember one day I was outside Frankfurt Airport sitting on the ground having a smoke because I smoked that time as well so I did sure. Um, I was talking to John Freeman on the phone and I was saying to him you know we could do what appears a house in the west of Ireland and she was saying yeah she said I was looking at that and we were thinking you know we could service the whole west of Ireland if we opened a place in Galway City and I said to her sure that makes no sense at all I said why would you open a place in Galway City I said, that's not much good, like I said, to people in Ballina or was common, you know. Mm, not I central said, enough. I said, like, I said, I'm not in self- yeah, I said, I'm not in selfish here, you know. I said, but I said, I said, I'm from Chum. I said, but Chum would be a very central pine forest, like, you know, rather than Galway City. And um, she said, well, we had looked at Cork as well. I said, but you're going way down south, Galway. Now I said, that's not going to suit Ballina again, a place like that. And uh, we had a bit of a discussion on the phone about it. And, um, we kind of agreed to disagree, but as it turns out, eventually, a few years later, they opened the place in Chum anyway. Um, I don't know much about how that's doing now, but I know that they opened the place anyway. Where is where is that in Chum? It's uh, up in Bishop Street someplace, up there near um, near Barry Egan's garage one time, and it's up along there someplace. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, so I think they opened that around 2013. So, so is that a kind of a walk-in place people can go into, or...? Yeah, I think you you can walk in and make a call and make an appointment and to, to receive counselling, you know, if you're having suicidal thoughts. All right. I don't know enough about it, to be honest with you, anyway, but anyway, I just know that they opened in two when they said they did. And, um, but, you know, like, like, there was, like, like the suicide rate was crazy. Like, I mean, like, you know, you were looking at there'd be a thousand people a year in Ireland dying by suicide. I know that the official figures were telling us like five, six hundred, but the figures that we've been told are not the true figures because... Like a lot of suicides go down as accidental death and, you know, unexplained deaths and misadventure and all that. And that's not the case at all, you know. They're, they're good, they're yeah, yeah, yeah. Suicide. There's, there's a, yeah, and this is the thing. It's like everything, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff reported and then there's other stuff that's not reported. So we never know the true figure sometimes, yeah, do we? Oh, 100%, yeah. And it was quite funny because at one stage I was in, um, I was in, I was only maybe two weeks into the walk and, I was in a pub in, in um, Carrigan Shannon and I post, posted stuff on Facebook and I was sitting in this pub and I, was, I wasn't having a pint, I was drinking coffee and sitting by the window and there was a few lads started making conversation with me anyway and um, there was one particular lad, and, you know, he was a big lad now, but he was murdering pints and he looked, he looked back and he said to me, you know what, he says, 
Can I say something to you, lad? And I say, I oh, want. He says, you're not a true fucking Irish man. That's exactly the way he said it to me. I said, well, what's this all about? I said, well, how did you make that out? He said, if you were two Irish men, you'd be walking the 32 counties, not the 26, you know? Now, the, yeah. reason, why, the reason why I wasn't walking the 32 counties was because they had a house were not based in Northern Ireland, so I thought it wouldn't be fair no. to ask people to donate in the north to something in the south. So that's what was what my original thinking for not doing it. Anyway, but he kind of got me a bit going through it because I, I am a two Irish man, if there ever was one. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of put a thought into you. It did, yeah. So he, I, 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 for a while I said nothing. Then I said to him, excuse me, what's your name in there? And his name was Michael. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Ackle. I said, all right, Michael, I'll tell you what. I said, you know what? I was thinking about what you said to me, and you know what? I think you're right. I should really be walking the first two counties. So I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, I'll change my route, I said, and I'll do the first two counties. But there's one condition attached. And he said, what's that? I said, you come with me. I said, you're a two Irishman, aren't you? You come with me. Yeah. He, he declined off a quick though. He said, nah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great ideas. <laughs> so, so the thing is, when you were walking, right, and, you know, you started out in 2000, what, what, what year did you start? 2011 or... 2011, yeah, yeah, 2011, yeah. Yeah, and you, did you walk then for a year or two years? or? Well, the, I finished the first walk on the weekend of the Galway Races, 2011. So that was, okay. about, that was about three months, I think. Um, and, um, but what happened then was, between that, um, I, I, um, I, I, done this, I done a second walk then. I said, I'll do the 32 counties because it was always a nightmare in my head. This fella, what he had said to me. So I said, fuck it. I said, I might as well do the 32 now. So I started all over again. I'd done the 32 counties. But I didn't do it for any specific charity. I just done it to raise awareness. All right? And to get people... Because suicide in Northern Ireland, like, was, was... Would you believe it? The suicide rates in Northern Ireland increased by 78% after the Good Friday Agreement was signed. Really? Now, that sounds that sounds crazy. And you'd think it would be the other way around. But... yeah. Yeah, well, once the peace agreement was signed, yeah, it was a study that was done over a period of 12 years by a, a, a doctor here in England. Um, I can't remember his name now. But, and he, he studied it for 12 years. And the conclusion he came to was, when the peace process was signed, all of a sudden people that were involved in, in say, in, in, the, um, in the conflict um, from, both, from both sides of the divide, right, they, all of a sudden they didn't have anything. They didn't have a purpose. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's funny because I met someone once and they said their brother was involved years ago in that. And they said when it finished, even though it was seen as criminal activity and terrorism, mm -hmm. it said their lives fell apart because exactly. it was like, it's like playing for the local football club and it stops. You have to Correct. find something new. Exactly. And the thing about it was they didn't have anybody to turn to. And you you no. could have had, you could have had people there that may have been involved in the killing of other people or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And whilst whilst the battle was going on, they felt justified in what they had done. But once it came to an end, and all of a sudden there was guilt, and there was what did I do? Um, and then but they couldn't turn to anybody. And it yeah, just, they it couldn't. Just, they couldn't. It just shot up. It just went. It went absolutely mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So come here. Let's go back a little. Um, Tell us about your early years in Tune. We, did you always live in Tune? Born and reared in Tune, born on the 16th of the 6th, 1966, down the, the Bonsecures Hospital in Vickers Street. Wow, wow. Uh, so your parents were your parents were Tune people? Yeah, uh, well, Kilcanley, both Kilcanley, both parents uh, from Kilcanley, they, they literally lived across the fields from each other. You could see one house to the other. Wow, yeah, okay. Yeah. So you were you were born in Tume and you, you like you lived there up until obviously you moved away in 2013 all your life. Yeah, yeah. The, my my father came into Tume in the 50s, but he was actually he was in Birmingham for a while first. He worked, I think he was he was a, on a on a bus conductor, but he didn't take to he didn't take to England, but he came back to Ireland and he he started selling teas and sandwiches going on to the fairs. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah, and he he done that for a good few years, and he had a big red Bedford Bedford truck, and he'd he'd have his his team of sandwiches there, and he went all over the country to the fairs, he'd done that for about I think it was eight years or so, and the um he bought he bought a premises then in Foster Grace and opened the dry cleaners there in about I think it was nineteen sixty five I think, and it's still there today. Wow, fifty years on, 50, 50, 50 years on. 
When you were growing up, where, where did you go to school in Tune? What, like the primary school and secondary? Where I did went, you go? I went to the presentation first, right? The primary school. And then I was in Pats. And then I was over at Gerlitz and I got I got my walking papers out of there. <laughs> really? <laughs> I got, were you in Pats in the secondary or in the primary? The primary. The uh, primary, okay. And then I went to Gerlitz for a while. I think I done about two and a half, three years there and I got my walking papers. Myself and Tommy Davin had a bit of a fall out, and she were great friends now, myself and Tommy. Uh, wow, wow, wow. I went over to yeah. Patsy and I lasted about two days in it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you were a rebel in school. Didn't oh, you? Gosh, no. It wasn't, it, it, they weren't good enough for you. That was really what happened. <laughs> I, hadn't, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stand it. I just hadn't got the patience. And I don't think school no. had the patience for me either. <laughs> and and some people are like that, you know. I I it was the same with me. I was left school at Intercert, and I did a carpentry apprenticeship. And I think if I'd stayed on, I wouldn't have been happy. So you have to, even when you're that age, you kind of know it. You know you're up for right. something else, don't you? Oh, so I sure. was mad to get out then. What did you do when you left school? What did you do? Well, I tell you, <laughs> I wanted to leave, and Kitty, my mother, didn't want me to leave. But the awful, I said, let him let him leave. He wants to leave. So I went. I went. Thank God, I done a welding course. Okay, uh, I completed that anyway, but I wasn't—I wasn't that I wasn't mad about the well to me either. I didn't know what I wanted, I suppose. And I didn't know what the old painting and decorating for a while, and I went over to England. Um, oh, I went over to England. Well, I, I was—we, I got married off and young as well. I was only twenty when I got married, and we had first son Angus. Okay, and, okay. First yeah. son Angus was born in nineteen eighty-six, and sure. Um, I went over to England, and he was about a year for, for a while working because there was no work in June, wasn't the thing. And I was doing a bit of paint, painting and decorating over there. So the money was mighty, like. Um, we were getting about 50 quid a day back in 87 when you wouldn't get that for a week in June. No, um, and it was a great adventure, too. Oh, yeah, it was. Um, done that for a couple of years. But then I, I came back then. Um, well, I only spent well, I didn't even spend a year in England. But then I came back and I was working in the cellar bar for Cyril Devan. And um, then Cyril was closing it down. And I said, Jesus Christ, what am I going to do now? So... I went up to the bank in Dublin Road and I asked your man, Jimmy Tierney, the manager. I said, well, you wouldn't give us a loan there of five grand. I said, I want to take over the cellar bar. And he started laughing at me. He said, that fucking den of iniquity. He says, not a chance, he said. So, um, they wouldn't support you? No, nah, he said, no way. But then I was walking out the door and I said, to him, just remember now, Jimmy, I said, you're putting me out of a job, kind of giving him a guilt trip. And I went down to the dry cleaner and said, and you ring the shop. And he says to me, he says, if you're all let goes guarantor for it, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. And I said, no, nah, forget about it. And he gave it to me, and I, I, I took over the cellar there for a few years. And... Hazard called his bluff, and he got him. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Were you working at the painting and decorating at the same time, or you gave it all up to focus on the bar? No, I gave, gave that up and just stayed at the bar, you know. And I wish I was young. I was, I was only 23, I think, when I took over the bar as well, sure. Um, so we a few great, few great years. That was the golden age in tune, kind of, though, as well, wasn't oh, it? It was great it was, times, yeah. a lot of pubs open. Yeah, and there was the West Awake in the middle of all that. You know what? The West Awake festival. My rent, my rent for the cellar bar at the time was, I think it was four and a half thousand quid a year. And the weekend of the festival in show, we took 16 grand in the pub. <laughs> wow. It's great to have the rent paid for four years. Uh, it was, it was bad. <laughs> and, 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 you know, back then, tax man got sick on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were different times. And the thing is that now everything is more rules and regulations. But when you consider in tune that time, all the bars that were open and, you know, and in the atmosphere, obviously, it was a different thing, wasn't it? And, you you know, the saw doctors were on a wave and yeah. the West Awake and yeah. there was, it was great times. And, you know, another thing, Simon, about it was back then, right, every disposable penny a teenager had, it was spent in the pub, right? Yeah. But now every disposable penny they have is spent on their phones and their internet and stuff like that. It's a complete, you know what I mean? Yes. It's not in the pub. No, and it doesn't come back around full circle. Yeah. It's going off to multinationals and other parts of the Absolutely. world and everything, yeah, you know. Yeah. Tell us, you, you mentioned there, Angus, and you've three kids. So what, what age is your kids now? Actually, Angus is, Angus is 34 now. Um, and he is, yeah. he has, uh, he's married now and he's bought a house there in Truman. He's married to Louise and they have a, Son Mikey, he's a great character. He's two and a half now, and they have another one on the way. And then Pierce is Pierce is in show. Pierce is my second son. Pierce is twenty nine, and he is he's got a couple of vaping shops there. One in show, and one in in Orin Moore, and he's going out with her, uh, Becky. And then I have my daughter Sarah. She was nineteen, and she's working in the pharmacy there in show, and she's working in car service station and going to college as well. So they're all keeping busy. 
they're all keeping yeah. busy and doing yeah. well. Do you see them often? Like, do you get back to tune sometimes, or they visit you? Oh, or? So prior, so prior to last March, like I was be home every four or five weeks, like you know. Um, but uh, since I was at home, and I was at home on the eleventh of March, and um, I came back here on the thirteenth, and uh, it was kind of that was the start of the COVID carry on. And then my mother got sick on the Sunday, and she ended up in hospital with the virus. She's been three twenty nine days, I think, in there. With, with the coronavirus, but thankfully she recovered. She recovered well. They didn't give her much of a chance, but she did. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I'm glad so to hear that. I haven't been home then, like. How, you know, in, in with the COVID crisis and everything and the, the coronavirus, how has it affected your family and yourself in general? Like, do you feel that, you know, mentally and, and like, obviously physically affected your mother and maybe other people, but do you think mentally it's affected the family in, in a big way? I suppose... Yeah, look, I, I find this um, at times, it does get me down a bit, I suppose. You know, that like, I can't go home when you'd love to go home. You know, you'd love to just go home for a couple of days and I can't do it. Um, no, I suppose, it, you know, they're they're all in tune and so they're all together and, they, they, you know, they're, they're looking out for each other and all that. Like, so um, they're, they're doing fine, you know. Um, I, I'd love to go home myself, but obviously I can't. And I just have I have it in my head now that I definitely won't be home till the next match at the earliest. So that'd be a full year, which is an awful, it's an awful long time, I suppose, you know, considering it's only like a couple hundred miles to home from here, you know. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing, you know, you kind of, you know, I was like that myself. I thought, oh, maybe Christmas, but then you kind of go, well, probably Easter, you know, and you, you have these times, Christmas, Easter, summer, and unfortunately for everyone now, if you're out of the country, it's too much trouble with quarantining yeah. before and after, and all. It's so much hassle, yeah, you know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do you feel that? Um, do you feel like you know with the vaccine that there's there's going to be one soon in the UK, or what do you think? I'm sure. Like I suppose you hear, we're hearing so many stories. Sometimes I think they're just drip feeding us to keep us happy. Do you know that kind of a? Um, it's a, it's a hard to know. Nobody knows really, I suppose. But you'd be hopeful that that maybe next summer, that we, if we can get through this winter. You know, and if next summer, by the end of next summer, they had something, at least we wouldn't have to face into a second winter because I think a second winter would be, it would be catastrophic. It would be terrible. Like, you know, I mean, like I know that the suicide rates are going to go up over the next few months. That, that I can assure you of. Yeah, because, yeah, you know, yeah. Be, because you, 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 I do think about that a lot. And I do be thinking, you know, if if the suicide suicide rates are high normally, you know, in a time when people's mental well-being is challenged and pushed to the limit, yeah. of course, the numbers and suicides could double. Yeah, they, they will definitely increase. Um, you know, um, like, you see this when this when this thing started. You recall during the summer, people were loving it. People were off work. I spoke to people and they said, "I'm I'm loving this, or I'm getting paid by the government, and I'm doing nothing. I'm out cycling every day and having a good time." You couldn't buy a bicycle for love or money here in this country. Because every, every bicycle shop is sold out. But now coming into winter, it's a different ballgame. And, and people are getting serious. You know? it, it's like that thing, you know, when you're younger and you get a day off school and you love it, but your parents don't care. But if you have six weeks off school, then things start yeah, being different, absolutely. no? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this is the thing now, people are looking at it and they were going, oh, yeah, I have time off and I can do a bit of golf and I can do these things. But now they're saying, oh, no, but you can't do this and you yeah. can't do that. And now people's liberties are being, you know, taken away yeah, from them. You've only so many daylight hours now and no sunshine and, you know, like even myself, I haven't got outside the house today because it was just such a rotten day. You know, whereas every day I go for a walk at least once a day, if not twice, but just today was such a miserable day. You know, that's it's kind of... But, but there's some people that are living alone and they must get off lonely and it's hard on them, you know, it's really hard and tough. Of course, yeah. And, and I mean, you know, the thing is, if you live alone in a house and you stand outside the gate waiting for someone to pass, in the summer you have a lot more hours you can stand at the gate. But in the winter when it's lashing rain and it's dark, you're in the house all the time, you know? And, and it's all these small things, isn't it? It's all these small things. So, so let me let, let's go back. I want to go back a little bit to um, to when the, you were when you were in the cellar. Okay, so you know there was like more or less seventeen years of a difference between the first and second time. No, yeah, or yeah. more or less. Years, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, what what was different? What was different the second time you went back in? Uh, it was completely different because, um, well, number one, the rent was crazy compared to what it was back in the early yeah. It was it was absolutely crazy. Yes. Yeah. That's just the way things were, rents were high. But I also noticed that, like, the pub scene had changed so much. Like, when I was in the pub game the first time, you know, if you went, 
I remember Tommy Verdon telling me one time, Tommy Verdon was a legend in Shum that he was in the drinks industry in supplying pubs and hotels and all that. I remember him telling me one time you could drive from Kerry to Donegal and not pass a job, not pass an off licence. But that was back in the in the seventies and eighties. But then all these off licenses started opening up at the service stations and supermarkets and um when I had the pub the first time, if you bought a pint there for a pound, you could buy the equivalent you could buy the equivalent of the off licence for ninety nine P, right? But now if you pay four pound in a pub for a pint, you'll buy the equivalent of the off licence for fifty five pence. So the difference is so it's mad, isn't There's it? such a gap between the off licenses and the pub that the, the whole culture has changed now and people are are more people are drinking at home. Like I mean like alcohol sales are up but the pub business is down because there's so many people drinking at home, you know? And that's the big difference. Yeah, this is the thing. I know of you know, people who maybe never went to the bars, but once then the whole off license thing kind of came in, it was a case of then they'd buy drinks and have them at yeah. home. And it was kind of a thing where people who were never drinking were drinking wine and vodka and things uh, every day. Yeah, and, and and drinking too much of it for some people. <laughs> yeah, so so in, in a way, the government's plan by, you know, raising the price of drinks and taxes and everything, in a way it backfired because it yeah. didn't prevent alcoholism. It brought it to the home. 100%. It made things a lot worse, 100%. It made things a lot worse, and that that brings all the other mental health issues yeah. with it, and everything, and domestic abuse, and yeah. everything. You know, yeah. and and uh, and tell me, like, how, how did you when you came back to the cellar the second time? Did you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to run it different now? These what what was going to be different the second time? Eric, to be honest with you, I, I didn't really have a plan. It, was, it just this, this, this like happened overnight. A, a guy rang me one night. And he said to me, Hazard, he says you should take over the cellar again, and I. I was after been running a poker club in town for about four years before that. And um, this fellow just rang me and he said, you know, I should take over the cellar. And I said, not a chance. I wasn't interested. I, I really wasn't interested. But he just, he was a good friend of mine. He said, go on, go for it, go for it. And I kind of thought, sad one, I go for it. But I didn't, my heart wasn't in it, to be honest, honest with you. Um, but I did, I took it over for, and I had it for about two years again. But um, it, it was just impossible. It was just impossible to make a living in it. Um, as I said, because you didn't have the same crowds. No, it's just, it's like you might have, you know, you, you have it the weekends, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you could, there was a, you see a Monday night there, you might take in 20 quid in the tail, you say, what am I doing here, like, you know? So um, I just got out of it. Then all, all of it. It's been that kind of a bar that, um, it's been a challenge for everybody, I suppose, in there. I you know Rossi, when he was in there a few years ago, and, and the thing is, because it's, it's been a small bar and kind of pokey and it's very hard sometimes to do other stuff. It like it was I'm sure for you it, it's all it was kinda of hard to have music or anything out there, wasn't it? Well you know, actually I haven't said that, got back in the eighty nine and nineteen ninety one, but we used to have music every Saturday night down there and we used to have great sessions, like really great massive sessions. And uh, we used to, I even had I even had a couple of bands that used to come over from the UK to play once or twice a year in there. And and we, and you made it work. Uh, do you know what we used to do? Obviously, we didn't have a cover chair at the door, right? But we used to have a raffle on a Saturday night, right? And the first prize might be a leg of chicken, daft things like that. And <laughs> I swear to God, we, <laughs> leg of chicken. I'm not joking you. We used to sell. Uh, was the chicken cooked? Was the chicken cooked? Sometimes it was. Sometimes it was. <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, it could have been a dog that wandered in. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And I swear to God, everybody would buy tickets. Wow. Everybody would buy tickets for it. And we'd always at least cover the cost of the band with the raffle tickets. And you're talking about like a band coming over from the UK could be 500 quid back then, like, and we'd still cover it. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> but it was great times, you know. You had to have the initiative to try and cover it, you know. Yeah. What, what was the biggest challenge you had in both times you were in the bar? What was the biggest challenge for you personally, you know? Um, well, I suppose... I was an awful whore for, um, like, not closing when I was supposed to close, put it that way, back in the first time round. Right, right. Um, it was a different type of lockdown. It, it was. <laughs> I mean, if, you know, back back then it was very strict. I mean, like, you know, yeah. if, you were, if it was 12 o'clock, you had to be out by 12 o'clock, like, you know, and the guards were knocking on the door. I tried right, never answer the door for them. I used to say to the lads, this is it now, like, if you're in now, because that time there was three shifts in, in, in the guards, right? It was they, they would work from 6 in the morning to 2 in the day. Two in the day till ten at night, and ten at night till six in the morning. So I said to the lads, "If you're here now after one o'clock, you have to stay till six because that's when the cops change shift." 
<laughs> you know? So yeah, it'll be door, a window. Yeah, if they come knocking on the door at three o'clock in the morning, you wouldn't answer it. But the only thing is, nobody could leave because the cops are sitting outside for an hour waiting. So nobody would leave at six in the morning because yeah. they'd have to go back to the station to change the shift. Then everybody would be out the door. It really was a lock in, wasn't it? Because you were trapped in your own bar. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was, Irish we were young, it was full crack. You know, it was full crack. Did the cops ever say to you, you know, Colin, we know you were in there now and you have to open the door? And would they ever say that to you the day after? They'd be shouting, they'd be shouting outside the door just to open the door. And I remember one, oh, I remember one night, <laughs> one night, hear this. We were down there one night, right? And there was a cop called Jim Kinney and he was banging and shouting and roaring like a lunatic. And we wouldn't dance the door, right? And I, I turned, I actually turned up the music, right? I actually turned up the music in the pub and it was blared. And we could hear it down Shop Street and he was going daft. But anyway, we couldn't leave till about 11 o'clock the next day, right? But my sister, Aideen, you know, I don't know if you know my sister, Aideen. I went down to Aideen and uh, there was no mobile phones and I had to go down the house. I said, Aideen, listen, you, you were working in the cellar last night, right? And you have to say that you, that you left at 12 o'clock, right? And she says, why? I said, just that's all you have to say to the cops, right? So the cops came to me and, uh, and I said, look, my sister was working and she closed up. I said, well, what happened was she forgot to turn off the stereo and the timer on it and it came on during the night. <laughs> so, and then actually, there really was a timer. Music, on the music and ghost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And wow. I, I said to the cop, I said, look, you can come down and see the timer. I said, because there is one on it and there really was. So Kenny came down and I showed him the timer, timer and he was going mad. He knew what I was lying to him, but he couldn't do me. <laughs> yeah. But but the thing is, it's all about the proof. And they were like, Jesus Christ, this guy is some stories. What else is he going to come out with next week? What they're going to say is the timer still fucked again? It's not. It can't be still broken or not working properly. They caught me eventually. That's good. They did. They caught me eventually. So they did. But it's a game. It's a game, isn't it? It's a game. I mean, that was always a game between the cops. You know, they 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 knew how it worked and they played it. I remember. I think there was plenty of. There was plenty of nights I had the cops drinking down there till six o'clock in the morning. Who don't forget? <laughs> of course, of course. And it's not the only place it happens. It's happened all over the country, you know. And 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 it and, and it probably still does in certain places. Yeah, no and tell done. me, there was no harm done to anybody. You know, obviously, the thing about anybody working in the bar trade for you personally was it hard being around the drink all the time? Like, did you have moments when you thought, "Fuck, I can't do this." I sure, sure I was going for days on end without even sleeping. I was flipping up 24-7 sometimes. You know, when you're young, you're full of energy. So you could drink 10 pints and go, and go into a ship. That was just the way it was. That was the way it was. I wouldn't be able to do it now, obviously. No, but it's, it's, it's you know, it's the demeanour of some people and the willpower. And, you know, the, the strongest of men and women have worked in the bar and felt succumbed to the demon drink, you know. So some people can't, are not cut out for it. And other people will be totally like, they'll say, oh, no, I'll never touch it. You know, it's it's like I don't touch my own stash kind of thing, you know. The only thing I would never do is I never did. I never actually drank behind the counter. You know, you see some places, some places you see that the, the, the bar man would have a drink from set up the counter and be sipping away while he was working. That's one thing I never done. I never, ever had a drink. I drank enough outside the counter, but never behind the counter. Outside, yeah, you made up for it. <laughs> you were ticking over till you got out. Yes. So come here, let's 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 move on to let's talk about, you know, the the, the your the organization, the stamp out suicide. So yeah. it, it's a serious topic and and one that's been a big part of your life over the last few years, mm. and uh, and it's just for anybody who doesn't know it out there, um, it's called Stamp Out Suicide, and and Colm, tell us a little about how it started and what how it operates. Yeah, well, basically how it started again was when I finished up the Irish walks, I got a few messages from people um, on Facebook, private messages from people in the UK that I wouldn't have known, like personally or anything, and they were saying to me, would you come to the UK and do a walk to raise awareness about suicide over here? And... Um, I remember one day I was down at the mother's house and I was kind of bored. And I looked on the map of the UK and I said, I wonder if it, would it be possible to do it? And so I went and I mapped out the the route. It was like 4,800 miles on the map. The map is up here on the wall behind me, so it is. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the map here and I'm thinking, how many of them routes you've walked uh, all that? Uh, that's that's the line I walked all the way. You see, I you can't see that. It's, it's basically in a... I said, I said, I put a post up on Facebook with a copy of that map and I said, well, this is what it is, lad. Um, if I come over, will you support me? And that was on a Wednesday. But should by Saturday, I had 106 messages from people saying they support me if I come over. So I said, I'll tell her. So I come over. 
And so I came over on, in Ju uh, July 2013 and Marie had arranged to meet me in Hollyhead. But I remember so the night before we came over, uh, we said we'd go to the Bridge Bear and show them today of going there and have a couple of pints, right? And the great outdoors there in God, but they were sponsoring my walk. They were sponsoring my walk and shoes, right? But they were to be delivered to the bridge by a courier that evening. So I went down to the bridge and I met up with Pete Finnerty and Vinnie Cosco and a few more lads. <laughs> and um, we said we'd have a couple of pints. You won't believe this. And uh, it was five o'clock the following morning. We're still on the bridge drinking pints. And I was supposed, oh, God. To, I was supposed to be getting on the boat. And, and the shoes arrived. The shoes, the shoes were sitting <laughs> up on the counter in a box. <laughs> I was supposed to go on at seven on the boat, get, on, get the, the boats up to the boat to take me to Hollyhead. Down the house in a big panic, packed the bags, packed my rucksack, and my mother Kitty was there and she was going to ask. And up to the bus and uh, got the bus into Galway. And then I was getting, trying to get on the bus in Galway. And your man in, in um, City Link said to me, You're too drunk to get on this bus. I said, I am not. And a big rucksack. I said, I am not. I'm sound. He said, No way, you're not getting on this bus. But do you know Paul Hines that does the um, cigarette vending machines there in show? You know, yeah, 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 no, Paul, yeah. Paul was actually doing the machines at the station there in Galway and he's seen it. He would over such a man. He says, I know that fellow well, it sounds. They let me on the bus there. And off we went to Hollyhead. He's always like that. <laughs> <laughs> he's not drunk at all. That's, that's, his, that's his nature. <laughs> so we went off to Hollyhead and then um, spent a couple of days in Hollyhead. And, and you, you made the boat. You got there You got there in time. Oh, yeah, I got in the boat in time, yeah, yeah. And uh, sure, um, I met Maria then Hollyhead, and we said we spent a few days in Hollyhead before I started the walk. So I'd arranged it to meet a guy called Keith Barrett, he's from Newcastle. He comes over to Tune regular, he's a great friend of the saw doctors and all that. And he he said he he drives a truck, and he said he dropped me from Newcastle up to um, Scotland. So we got to Scotland anyway, and um, he dropped me in um, Inverness, and then I got a train up to uh, Wick. It's in the northeast of Scotland, it's way up there in the northeast. So then I had it to do with it. I had to walk down then through every county, and it was it was, took me eleven months, and um, but I was very lucky because before I went over, um, and I was chatting to Leo Moore and Leo Fair Play to him. He he posted a lot of stuff on Facebook, and you know he'd have an awful lot of followers, and so people you know followers in in the UK from the side actors, and so they all started, you have a large network. Exactly, yeah. so people started latching onto it, and sure, I I walked for over three hundred days anyway. And I only had to sleep out one night, and that was the second night when I was in the most northerly point of Scotland. Other than that, um, I got a plan every single night, and it was it was some awful close calls. Like there was, there was the there was a guy called Aidan Murphy, a great friend of mine that I never met. How tough that sounds! But he 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 supported me from day one when I was walking in Ireland. And Aidan he was in County Mead, but poor old Aidan passed away two years ago, very young, only fifty years of age. Uh, when, when, when you say when you say you never met him, you, you, he was a Facebook friend. Yeah, but he was constantly putting things. Okay, he was constantly putting things on Facebook about what I was doing, and he he he, he knew a lot of people, and he was well connected, like you know, and um, even like he he'd ring Maria and he'd say, "Does Hazard need any boots or T-shirts?" and he'd post them over to me, and he never we never actually wow. Him, but he, he's a lovely fellow. I spoke to him on the phone regular. Like I mean, I spoke to him probably on at least. That was nice, wasn't it? Yeah. And then he rang me one day about four years ago and he said to me, he says, you know, he said, I've cancer, he said. But he said, I'm going to beat the fucking thing. And he even set up, he set up a blog about, he called it Fuck Cancer, actually. And he had a big following on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, anyway. It's like everyone saying, fuck coronavirus yeah, now, yeah. it's like fuck cancer, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a great help as yeah. well. And then, wow. There was other people like, you know, I mean, I could name really as a people, but just off the top of my head, like there was... But I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure you've you've met and forgotten so many people along the way. Yeah, yeah. It, like it was just mad. Do you know what I mean? Like you know, there was, that, that was the Keith Barrett story. Keith dropped me up, and he actually he couldn't drop me the whole way, and he got out of the truck, and he said, "Here's twenty quid for the train." He says, <laughs> <You know? laughs> "Did you did you have a tent with you I just had, in case, or had, yeah, yeah. did you, you had?" I carried, did you have to camp any night? Just the, just the second night was the only night I had to use the tent. So that was in the morning. That was looking out to the North Sea, the most northerly point in Scotland. Like, so, um, other than that, so I carried the tent for about five months and then I said, all right, man, it's like this. I said, I got rid of it. I gave it, like, Maria came down to meet me in someplace. I said, bring this tent, which I said, I'm still up carrying it. 
<laughs> you went on the faith of people. Yeah. Was it a case like the other time where you kind of knew a few days in advance that you were you had a place, or did you just find out every day? Ninety five percent of the time, I didn't know till that evening where I was going to be. I wouldn't really? wouldn't have a clue. I just. I'd, I'd get to a town and I'd be posting on Facebook. I'd be posting in the morning and said, I'm heading to this town. And then um, but sometimes what happened is somebody would message me saying, you know what, I'm, I'm five miles away and I can come and pick you up and drop you back there in the morning. Do you know what I mean? So people, one guy drove 60 miles. One guy drove 60 miles. He seen it on Twitter, right? And he drove 60 miles and he picked me up in St. Helens and brought me to his house in, in um, oh, someplace in North England. I can't remember now. And the next day he dropped me back again to continue on where I left. Wow, home. that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was looking in that sense. You know, but you, ha- you, have to lo- you have to love, you know, the effort of people sometimes and the spirit, the great spirit. And, you know, it's the thing is, it's great to see how far people will go sometimes. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Isn't it? And it's amazing because uh, it's brilliant. there's a guy there from True Melaman and he's a pub in London called Frosty's Bar. And um, I don't know if you know Frosty or not, but yeah, he's, well, I stayed with himself and, and Liz during the walk. And uh, he brought me down to this pub tonight. I was there, and, uh, and he, he said to me, see this pub here, Hazard? He said, I'm going to own this pub someday. And I said, don't be daft. I said, what the fuck do you want a pub for? And that was, that was 2013. And three years later, he rang me one day, and he said to me, do you know that pub I told you about? I said, yeah. And after buying it, he said. <laughs> he, he, wow, that's really good. He, he, he's actually a trustee of the charity. When we were setting up the charity, we, we had to get trustees, and Frosty came on board himself, and two other lads from Leeds and they um they helped us set up the whole thing, you know. And uh, so ever since we set it up, like, we're, we've been able to um, provide counselling to anybody in the UK um, that's, you know, having suicidal thoughts. And it's very simple how it works. Is they can just contact... And, and it's in, it's in, it's in Scot- Scotland, Wales and you and England. And, and Northern Ireland. Is it? And Northern Ireland, yeah. And Northern Ireland, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Tell us about it. How it works is it? Is it like pay at the house in some ways, or is it different? No, it's completely different because all all our phone counseling, all our counseling is done via phone link, right? So, in other words, you know, sometimes people don't have access to travel, so they like they might they could have a, a, an appointment for a counselor, it could be ten miles away, and they don't have any access to travel. So we said, what about if we set up a phone line service? So how it works is we we, we got counselors to come on board with us all all counsellors that have their own private practice and they give us a couple of hours, each of them gives us a couple of hours a week. So if somebody is having suicidal thoughts, they can contact us on our number and then we'll have a chat with them and we'll offer them counselling and then so we say, right, if you'd like to go on a counselling programme, we can start on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, whatever and then we we contact one of the counsellors and we say, right, listen, we have a client here can you uh, start counselling with this person next Tuesday and they say, yeah, no problem. And then it's it's for forty five minutes a week, um, and up to ma- maximum of eighteen weeks. But you find that most people, um, after uh, between six and ten weeks of counselling, they, it does improve their mental health enough to they don't have to continue on with the counselling. But they can always come back to us again anyway, like if they didn't need more counselling, you know. So it's good. It's- I have a question for you because you know, obviously, around suicide, there's always a big stigma, and mm-hmm. I suppose for a lot of people, they. It's it's a feeling of being judged as well because mm-hmm. I I can imagine you know if somebody wants to ask for help but they want to ask for help of somebody they know they kind of are thinking well how will it make me look will it make me look weak will it make me look crazy and that's pro- at least with the phone line when it's somebody in, you don't know it's anonymous it takes away that stigma doesn't it absolutely yeah um, it does and um, well the thing about it is that when we do talk to people right. Um, one of the most important things we, we, we will try and do is we will try and get that person to get a friend or a family member involved, okay? Um, okay. Simply because... Well, like a sponsor kind of thing. Well, just somebody that, they, somebody that they can feel they can trust because, okay, that person has contacted us, right? So they have, they have shared their problem with us, okay? So then if we, can get a, then if we can get them to trust a family member or a friend, now the problem has gone three ways instead of two ways. It went from... One person's problem, okay, to be shared by somebody, to be shared by somebody else. Um, and each time that person that's in this situation is able to share it, it actually takes a, a pressure off themselves, you know. It really does, like. Um, of course. Of course. And, and even even for the person, the family member who is helping them, to know that it's not just them helping the person, they have another person. It's like this triangle. 
so they can rely on that person for support too. Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. And the thing about it is, like, um, and this is from people I know that have survived suicide attempts. Every single person that survived suicide attempt will tell you that they, they did not want to die anyway. It's just they're 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 in a frame of mind where they can see the only option has been death, but they don't want to die. But they feel that they're in so much pain that the only thing that can get rid of the pain is by ending their own life, which is not the case at all. There's, there's, there's numerous ways of, of improving. Here's a question that, you know, always I've wondered in my mind. And like when you look at, you know, I live here in Spain and, you know, I, I've obviously I've, I've kind of had family members in the past that, you know, have been involved in suicide and so on. Mm-hmm. And, and recently I had a family member in, in my family in Carlo and stuff. And it affects everybody's life in, in every county, in every part of Ireland. And the thing about it is that I wonder sometimes, you know, being outside the country and looking in, like I see here with the Spanish people, if they're expecting the, the summer to start in, in, let's say, May, and it doesn't start, it affects their well-being. They, they start getting depressed because the sun is not here. Right, yeah. So it got, it got me thinking one day, I was because th- I always had this in the back of my mind, I thought, I wonder, does the weather play a part in Ireland? Like this, the whole, you know, when people say it's a great day for the high stool. Yeah. So do you think like there are various elements that come together and create a perfect storm, like the weather, depression, lack of jobs, all these things that come together and just like, it's that's it. A melting pot. Yeah, well, the weather will play a big part, but you know, um, for almost any person that's suicidal, right, you will you will be able to connect it with with loss of some form. And when I say that, I mean like um, it could be loss of a job, it could be uh, a breakup of a relationship, loss. Um, if somebody ends up in prison, it's loss of freedom. If somebody ends up in financial pro- problems, it's loss of money. Everything will go back to loss of some. If somebody has a death in the family and somebody else ends up suicidal, it's because of loss again. There's, loss is always connected with, with suicide in some way or other, you know? Right, right. What you say, it's loss, but it could be shame, but it's all connected to the loss of something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. You know, I mean, when somebody, somebody loses their job and then they feel so insecure and they feel that they let their family down and um, they start having these suicidal thoughts and they think it's the only way out, Like, but in fact, it's not the only way out at all. And generally, for most people... For most people that, that receive counselling, um, say they had attempted suicide and then go on to receive counselling, um, for most they never go on to attempt suicide again anyway, if if they receive the counselling, obviously. But if you don't receive the counselling, the chances are you will go on to attempt suicide again. Yes. And and why do you think that it affects more in men more than women? And and obviously why in certain countries the numbers are higher you know, because like if you look, as I said, at Spain and, you know, Ireland, the numbers are hugely different. And I don't know if the numbers are hugely different in the UK, but it seems to be more of the Scandinavian countries as well. It's pretty bad, I think. And so, so why? Do, well, let's go. Let's go back to the men and women. Why do you think it affects men more? Well, I think men, men feel that they're supposed to be the, the provider anyway. It's kind of nature, isn't it? Like, um, I mean, 78 percent mm. of all suicides are men. Men don't tend to talk as well. Like men, men feel that they can't talk. They feel that it's um, it's like it's not brave, is it? Like you know, it's it's, it's a weakness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas women will talk. Now, but also there is another thing about that too, uh, Simon. Um, would you believe it? Um, the twice as many women attempt suicide as men, even though seventy-eight percent of all suicides are by men. So you'd say, well, how could right. that be? Okay? Um, and I'll tell you the reason the reason why there's more men dying by suicide than women, because men will use a more violent method to attempt suicide in the first place. So they're more likely to succeed. Okay. Whereas like a man will man will generally um either use a rope and your chances of surviving a rope are practically zero, okay? Whereas a woman more than likely will take an overdose and your chances of dying by an overdose are pretty slim in the first place. So women tend to survive uh, suicide attempts for that simple reason they don't go for the more violent method of suicide and th- thanks for the god that's that's a blessing because men kind of in some way are looking for a way where there's no way back whereas sometimes when women do it it's a, 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 it's less violent and it's more calm it, it's 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 actually to do with vanity as well okay believe it or not a woman a woman 
doesn't want to be found looking not like what she should look beautiful like, if you know what I'm saying. A woman doesn't want a woman doesn't want to be found in a state where it looks you know, it sounds terrible, but you know, I mean if, like you won't hear a woman using a gun to take their own life, will you? But but you know, Colm, here's the really interesting thing now, and this is what you know I think has to change is we're having this conversation now and we're talking about things like that, mm-hmm. that somebody could be listening to the podcast and could say, oh, well, they shouldn't be talking about that now. That's too technical and there's too much detail. But I think that's the problem is that when people learn about these things and when people realize these things, it kind of opens up their consciousness to what suicide actually is. Because, you know, as well as anyone in Ireland, even when they report suicides, it's a tragedy. They don't say it's a suicide. They say it's a tragedy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they, they don't say, they don't say in the church, you know, he took his own life. They don't, you know, everything is, is kind of to preserve the honor of the family. And I mean, that's great. But the thing is, it's like right now with the whole thing about the, the tomb babies and everything, locking away the ark, putting everything in the archives. It's like a hushed Ireland. Everything is like, don't talk about it, and it's better that way. So, I mean, I, I think it's great right now for you to be saying, well, look, at, here's some actual things. This is the reason why some of these things happen, because we're involved in it. We know. I mean, I think that's a brilliant thing. And I think someone I, someone could say, put, post comments when this podcast goes up and says, you know, you're going too far in that. But I don't think so, because at, in this stage in life, you know, if you can't talk about these kind of things, you're not going to help anybody, are you? Hundred percent. I mean, they, they, what, what what harm are we doing in talking about reality and facts? You know, they're, they're just playing facts. Yes. Um, and I, what I I think it's very important that that people should be educated in in how to spot the signs of suicide in in others, because that would that would reduce the suicide rates um, drastically. Um, and there there are there are signs you can see you can see signs in people, right? And I've, I've heard people in the past, you know, saying after a suicide in a family, they said, God, you know what? There were signs, but I just didn't pick up on them. Um, and like, for example, like some of the signs would be, you know, if a person um, starts getting very quiet and into themselves and not as outgoing as they would have been, or if somebody starts giving away their possessions, um, that could be a sign, especially with younger people giving away um, their possessions, like you know, teenagers given maybe one of their favorite CDs or a piece of jewelry to one of their friends. There's a reason, there's a reason why these things are happening. Um, there's loads of signs, and the thing is, what you you probably you probably recognize is most people, if they're worried about someone, they will say to them, "I hope you're not going to do something stupid, area." Okay, and that's something yeah, you should never right. say to anybody. What you should say to somebody is. Have you have you been contemplating ending your own life, or have you thought about suicide? Okay, because research has shown that if a person is suicidal and you ask them that question, ninety percent of all people that are suicidal will actually answer answer it truthfully and say yes, I have been contemplating suicide. Okay. Now the thing about so you have to be open and frank. Absolutely, no point saying you're not thinking about doing something silly or stupid yet because. Automatically, what you're doing is you're shutting them out. You're telling them there's, you're telling them that they're stupid. Yes. You know? Yes. If somebody is suicidal yes. and you say to them, "I hope you're not going to do something stupid, are you?" Well, the answer is going to be no because you're just telling them they're stupid. But if you say to a person, "You're you're you're already judging them," so you're saying to them, "If you do that, it'll be the most stupid thing you'll ever do," and these are the reasons you shouldn't do it. But you're not actually saying, you know, are you contemplating suicide? Do you need help? Yeah. Exactly, and and when you when you ask somebody if they're suicidal, and if they are, as I said, nine out of ten will tell you the truth, and that's the biggest fear for most most people is well, what do I do if he says, oh yeah, I'm suicidal, okay, and well, my advice would be if 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 they do say they are suicidal, we'll just sit down with them and say, okay, well, look, I'm here to support you, I'm here to listen to you, you know, we can, we can have a chat about this, okay. And be prepared to sit down for as long as it takes and don't judge in any way at all. Don't judge what's going to, what they say to you, but then offer the, offer your support and then suggest getting somebody else involved, like seeking professional help, okay? Getting another family, getting a family member involved. And then that's the next step. And then once you get the professional help, it just takes, it just takes on its own life and after that. And it, people end up, you know, being in a lot better place by getting proper support and proper help. 
rather than shutting them out saying, you won't do something stupid, will you? No need for that at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and the thing is, by saying that, you're you're not really kind of saying what they're going to do. It's like you're skirting around the outside correct, of the subject, correct. but you're not. Whereas when you say the word suicide, mm-hmm. it probably makes it very real for some people. Yeah. They, they realize, wow, this person is on my wavelength. They're actually, yeah. they can look in my eyes and see what I'm thinking about. And then also the feel, the feel that, well, you know what, you're concerned for them. You actually do care about them. And another thing, you should never say commit suicide either. Commit is a word you shouldn't be using. With, with suicide. Mm, mm. Like, you, know, you can use the word suicide, but don't choose commit suicide. Can I ask you, in, in you know, in your experience, you know, dealing with people, obviously, in that thing, do you, do you think that there's also the, you know, the, the, the people who are left behind who feel the guilt and everything, mm-hmm. do you feel that that also adds, a, that's a huge part of the problem, is that people don't know the reasons why someone took their own life and they feel guilty for it, and, and you know, this can put them into a state of depression. Absolutely. That, like, that's a big thing, isn't it? Who you leave behind mm-hmm. and what you leave behind. And it, it causes all the problems. I mean, it, it leaves a, an absolute trail of destruction. I mean, like, for every suicide, there are 25 people directly affected. Just, I mean, absolutely directly affected. And the guilt, the guilt that people have, you know, they have no reason of guilt, but they just feel it. They think, well, what, I could have done something. Why didn't I? Why didn't I ask them this question? Or why didn't I do that? And it's just terrible. And they're left all the time with questions and no answers. And I remember one time talking to a woman down in Wexford, and she lost her son to suicide. And she was telling me that she found it very hard. And then a man came to her that had lost his daughter. He drove all the way over from Kerry someplace. He didn't even know her. And he came to her and he said to her, look, and he said, you have to get to a point where you stop asking why. Because un- un- until you stop mm. asking why, you're never going to grieve properly. And right. she doesn't ask why anymore because she knows that she will never get an answer. So she doesn't ask why. Yeah. Do you know? And Yeah, it, it, it's it's kind of like throwing the stone into the well and waiting for it to hit the bottom. You just don't know. Yeah. You you would It might never come back because that's the biggest thing, I think, for lots of families is why why it happened why did they do it mm-hmm. and you know you always hear oh there was no signs and he seemed happy or she seemed yeah. happy and you know it, it, it you'll never know nobody will ever know that's the, the sad part about it isn't it yeah you'll never you, you, you never know you don't have an answer you might have you might have presumptions in your head and all that but you can you can be eating yourself up for the rest of your living days and why why the fuck did they do it what could i have done well you know what yeah you're never going yeah. to know why and you have to accept it and even those people who maybe will even know it, that note will probably not say the full reason why, or you know, no. it's more of a just, you know. Yeah, you can read a note and all that. And that's fair enough. They'll leave a note, but you, you, people still will question themselves even with the note and say, "Well, why didn't I flip and see it? Why didn't I see this?" You know, and you're not going. I yeah, Colm, I don't know if you remember, obviously, a few years ago, and there was like a, a few young suicides in around Tum, Abbey, Nakmoy, around that area. Of course I knew, yeah. And, yeah, and, and, but it, it was really sad because, you know, you had a situation there where, you know, there was one family affected and then the, another family, the friend or yeah. whatever. And do, do you see that a lot where, with young people that, you know, the, the, the suicide has this kind of a double impact where, Another friend of theirs takes a life, their life because of it. Do you do you see that a lot? Or it, yeah, it does. It does happen. No, no question about it. I mean, like, um, for example, if for example, say, um, say we call him Johnny, was to take his own life tomorrow. Yeah, and he had three siblings. Okay, well, each one of them three siblings now become four times more likely to take their own life than you or me. Because okay, okay, what happened? Yeah. Um, that's like that's a fact as well, you know. And um, then with with suicides with youngsters, um, yeah, it does happen. It happens quite a lot, where you know one person in 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 the village might take their own life, another person goes and does it too. But that other person may have done it, whether the first person's done it or not. Anyway, if you know what I mean, it it was a spur, but maybe the thought was already there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing about it is too. Like, that's a really interesting point. I never knew that. What you said about the the family being four times more likely, yeah, you know, to take it. So, d- does that like with modern kind of counselling methods, 
do they take that into account that if a fam- if someone takes their own life and their siblings, do do they have to work with those siblings to get those thoughts out of their head? Yeah, but like most most places I know of now, if if there's a suicide in a family, um, you know, people other people get involved, um, you know, support groups, and they will be there to to support the um, siblings of the person that, that dies by suicide. You know. And it's very important. And I mean, you know, like, of course, we could talk about this all night and it's one of those things. But I mean, I, I think some of the points you brought up there, you really have to be spoken about that people kind of are sometimes embarrassed or ashamed to talk about, you know, the, the details. And, and, you know, as I said, it's never a suicide. It's always a tragedy. But the, the thing is that the more we talk about them, whether people like it or not, the more that they'll be out in the open. And I think especially for young people listening, I like anyone who listens to this podcast and hears what you're saying about it and, and you know, your experience and will go, you know, I, I, I'm glad that somebody is actually talking about the details of these things, what happens. And because the details are what makes the change. That's when people know things like that, they can say, I didn't know that. And that can make me kind of improve my life. And I can, Maybe that's like, you know, for if you have somebody listening right now who's who have a family member or cousin or anybody who took their own life and they're feeling a certain way, then maybe they can look and go, you know, maybe I will talk to somebody. And I mean, that's really important. So for me, the details, whether they be whether they they affect you or whether they, they you don't want them to be heard, I think they have to be heard. Let's talk, let's talk about um, let's talk about you know the 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 money you raised and you you told me a story about the money and the consequences of what happened okay, after. Right, and also, yeah. can you tell yeah. everybody what happened, what happened, tell us tell us what happened with the money you raised? Okay, well, when, when I decided to do the UK walk, um, um, well, Peter House weren't in the UK anyway, and I wanted to do it for some organisation some organisation in the UK, but. I was approached by somebody from Console in Ireland. If you remember Console, they were at the National Prevention Su- National Suicide Prevention Society in Ireland, and um, I was approached by one of their uh, workers to see what I do for Console in the UK because they had opened a place actually in London, uh, down in Westminster, and um, so I said, "I yeah," I said, "That would be great. I'd be glad to do that." And so they told me that they would have been providing counselling to people um, in London and that they were especially um, towards the Irish, but not necessarily Irish, but that was, you know, part of the, what they were doing. And um, so I said, grand, so I'll do it. So I started promoting it for console and um, we raised a lot of money for console, probably over 100,000 quid. And um, when we finished up then, uh, when I finished the walk in July 2014, um, but actually, along that journey, one guy had actually was giving me a check for twenty thousand quid uh, for a console, and I said to him, "This was in December of two thousand and thirteen." And I said to him, "Look," and I said, "I won't take that money off you." I said, "Until I finish the walk." And look, luckily enough, I, I didn't take it off him because, as it turns out, uh, console came under investigation the following year, and seemingly there was a lot of money gone missing. I don't know if it was a million or two million, I don't know how much it was, but um, Paul Kelly, who was the founder of Console, he was getting prosecuted, and, but unfortunately he went on to take his own life as well. And that's very ironic, isn't it, really? Uh, yeah, very ironic. quite strange, you know. But like, seemingly, it was a massive investigation. I mean, like, seemingly there was a there was a, a show jumping horse worth 50,000 quid involved. There was money spent on, massive money been spent on credit cards with holidays and stuff, and and it was just awful after finishing that walk and having done all this for them that I, I didn't, didn't, um, how do I put this? I felt, I felt so sorry for the people that had supported what I was doing, that made donations and for what I had been doing through the UK and then to see that this Irish outfit, like, you know, from my own country had basically just swindled and kind of yeah. along the way, you know? Um, did did you feel did you feel a lot of guilt because you said because you know it's like as you said it, it, there were fellow Irishmen and it was an Irish organization and you kind of feel like look it was nothing to do with me I gave them the money and everything but I'm ashamed to say that they're fellow Irishmen I, I'm sure you felt well, that it no was rotten yeah it was it was an awful feeling um, in the beginning but then when I sat down and thought about it I said look at you know like I I was as 
I was totally um, ignorant as to what was going on as, as the man on the street that was making donations online for it. Like, you know, I didn't have any clue what was going on. Yeah. I had no idea at all. But I, I, I kind of half smelt a rash um, at one point, though, when, when, when that check was being given and um, one of the employees down in London rang me up and he said to me, he said, I'll fly up, he said, uh, tomorrow and collect that check. I thought that was a bit strange. I remember saying it to Maria, that, that's very odd. Like, why would he offer to come up and collect a check? You know, and fly up at that matter. Yeah. Get a flight up from London. And, and, and it, it seemed to be a panic about it. Like, you know, yeah. maybe they needed the money, maybe they needed the money to keep the kitty going or something. Possibly, I don't know. I honestly don't know. But I, I just declined. I said, no, you won't come up and collect that money. I said, because I said, I have to finish my walk before that will be paid over. Do you think that... Besides Paul Kelly, do you think there were other people involved with him? Oh, I honestly don't know. I don't know. I think, I, I, I think, I think there's more charges coming, but I don't know who they're coming to. But I believe that there's other charges in the, in the pipeline as well. Like you know, I mean, like, so, so so really, in 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 essence, the only money that survived that thing was the the money from the guy that yeah. the check, no? Yeah, yeah, and that, yeah, and that's how that's how Starbucks was that came about because. Um, they had, they had actually asked me, Consol had actually asked me when I finished the walk, but I come work for them in the UK, okay? And that was in, in the in November 2014. And like then it was coming towards Christmas and I said, yeah, we'll have a job for you now before the Christmas. And that didn't happen. And then Christmas came and went and I said, what's going on here? Like, you know, I said, I need to get out and go work on this. I mm. don't have a job for me. Because I didn't, I never set out for this to continue on the way the road I took it. I had planned to finish my walk and get on with other things in life, but anyway, that's that's just the way things happen. But then, um, but February came of the following year, and that was two thousand fifteen, and still nothing happened. So I rang the guy that was giving the check, and I said to him, "What happened with this check?" And he said, "I don't know." He said, "He said I said have this check for them, but they've never come looking for it." So then it was started saying there's something went yeah. on there, something went on, and then it all it all kind of. Hit the media in June of 2016, I think it was. I got a call from a guy one night saying to me, um, he sent me actually a copy of what was going to be in the front of the next day's paper because he had connections there. And I said, "Oh my God, look at this!" And that was the end, that was the end of console then because obviously the, the government had it because the government like it was it was you know it was basically funded by the government too. Like you know the government would give them millions every year. Of course. Um, it, it, it caught everyone off guard. Mm. And, and uh, come on, tell us, um, you know, you, you obviously you've been involved in the horse racing for a long time and, and stuff. And um, how did you, you you've kind of linked the, your, the horse racing with Stamp Out Suicide too, no? Uh, yeah, it was, um, again, it's, it's, it's funny how things happen. Like um, myself and Maria were going to a concert in, in Nottingham a few years ago. Um and uh, Robbie O'Sullivan there from Chum, Robbie lives in Nottingham and we arranged, we were going to stay with him and we went to this concert anyway, uh, Nathaniel Ratcliffe, but it was so packed, it was crazy packed, it was dangerous. I said to Marie after about two songs, I'm getting the fuck out of here and I don't feel safe in here at all. So we went down to a pub hmm. and we met up with um, a guy called Peter Murray and um, he's, a, he's got a company there in Liverpool and his brother-in-law, John Neal, and they're, they're other men into horse racing, these lads, and they had a few race horses. And they, they just said to me, you know what, we, we, we'd like to do something to, you know, help out the charity. So that year, they'd done a, um, a Cheltenham preview night in, in Liverpool. And they got like maybe eight or yeah. people to come along and they raised a couple of grand for us. And they've done it this, they've done it every year since. And they've done it in St. George's Hall in Liverpool two years ago. And they had like 180 people there. And, they raised three or four thousand that night, and every year they do it for us. And then um, John's son Jamie, who was who was now a jockey, um, so they now they they financed that he wears the the Stamp Out Suicide logo on on the britches. So during the races, and again, it's getting the word out there that people can see that we're there to help people. Because look, at, people take their own lives for numerous reasons, and gambling can be one of them too. But that doesn't mean you shut down the gambling yeah. just because you know. I mean, it's like, that's like saying shut down the pub because it's alcoholics. But at least our name is out there now amongst that circuit. And, if, you know, if there's somebody there that's having suicidal thoughts, our, our name is there for them to help, you know, for us to help them. And um, it's just another avenue that we've gone down. And um, we've been, these, these guys have been so supportive of Sample Suicide. It's unbelievable, like. 
you know, and it's, it's like that. And, and tell me, and that's good. I mean, that's great. I mean, because, you know, when you can get sporting organizations involved in stuff like that, it's great because, you know, years ago, sporting organizations were pillars for, you know, Guinness and Marl's Breath for motor racing and everything. So they were, it was very commercial. Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, if you can get a charity on the britches yeah, or yeah. on a football strip or anything, yeah. I think it's amazing. And if you can put UNICEF on a football jersey, whatever. Yeah. You know, how, how long have you been, how long have you been into horse racing all your life? Is it? Since I was a grammar, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man into horse racing, yeah. Was that something that came from your dad or was it from the family or what, you know? I, I don't really know where it came from. Really. I just, just something that was, which I suppose it's, 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 it's an Irish thing too, isn't it? Like <laughs> everybody, everybody loves horse racing in Ireland. Yeah, do you have a favourite race meeting? Ah, uh, sure, Cheltenham has to be the one. Cheltenham, Cheltenham is the one. And do you, do you go when you can? Or no, I, I haven't gone racing for years. Um, I used to go a lot years ago, but I haven't. I, I actually them lads that, that that I was telling you about that the supporters they brought me to the races a few years ago, right down in um, uh, uh, down Pat, not down Pat, um, Bangor. Um, that's the last time I was at a race meeting. But um, well, I just I just love the whole thing. I, I, I sit down, I was, I was watching it today. I didn't, didn't have a bet or anything. It was just, I, I just love watching the race. And I love a bet sometimes, but not all of the time. What do you think now, you know, with the argument in Ireland at the moment? Because people are saying, you know, obviously you can't visit the family, but you can go. There's horse racing and there's football games happening without fans, of course. But what do you think of that, where people are giving out about it? Do you know what? It's, it's, it's awful hard. It's awful hard to know. I mean, like I've seen somebody had a post up there today on Facebook, um, one of the lads from Joom. And I just looked at it and I said, well, he's right in a way. It was a picture of a guy st standing on the first tee with a golf club in hand. And there was a picture beside him of a rugby scrum. And it says, you can do one of these and you can't do the other. Now, the one you can do is the rugby. You can do the rugby and you can't play in golf. Now, to me, that's absolutely ridiculous. There's no, there's no logic to that at all. But at the same time, I'm very much in favour of people sticking to the rules as much as possible. I mean, like, you know, I, I, this thing about people refusing to wear face masks, I, some people are going to slate me for saying this, but I think everybody should wear one. Um, what, what harm are we going to do? If it turns out in 10 years' time that we discovered a face mask were no good, well, what harm did it do to wear it in the first place? You know, it wouldn't have done any harm to wear it. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you in that respect. I mean, that, um, you know, I think, you know, if, if we have to wear face masks to prevent, obviously, the spread of the, of the disease. But the only thing that, you know, I'm more aware of, and I, I see this now even with my own kids and everything, is that, um, that and I've, I, you know, I've, I've seen some doctors talking about the fact that, you know, when kids are in school now and their faces are covered all day, they're rebreathing their own carbon dioxide and monoxide and everything. And the problem with this is that, you know, I didn't really know this, that we, our immune system is built from breathing the fauna and the air outside. You know, we, we, we use the natural air and all the plants and everything to, to grow our immune system. So the point is that if your face is covered for six and seven hours, and it happens over months and months and maybe a year or two. The problem is that hopefully this won't happen, but that kids may have consequences of this in three or four years. You might get kids who develop asthma. I didn't realize that kids were supposed to wear them in school. I didn't. I, I, don't, I don't think that's the case here. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be on for that at all. But I'm just saying, like you know, you go to Tesco's there. Right? Why not put on a face mask when you go in there? Like. Uh, you know, it's, I'm not saying to wear a face mask walking down the street because that'd be ridiculous. But I think just going into places like uh, supermarkets, why not just put it on? I think I think short term, there it's it's fine and it's good. It's just I think you know, like you know, my wife is a teacher and they have to wear the mask eight hours a day, and you know, people in offices have to wear them all day. And the problem is that now, short term, we're looking at a situation where we're preventing a disease, you know, or, or preventing a virus, but long term the implications of us rebreathing our own air will be the thing that we'll be talking about in a few years because it's like everything. We don't know enough details yet and we don't know enough facts, but it would be sad. I mean, because, you know, it's pretty sad. I mean, when you hear kids in school and they're doing sports and the, the instructor or the teacher is saying to them, no, keep your mask on. And they're like, but I'm finding it hard to breathe when I'm running. And they're like, yeah, but you have to keep your mask on. These are things that we haven't got to yet where, the, the health services have said, actually, this is a danger or this is not good for kids.
that would all come down the line. But at the moment, it's just very complicated, isn't yeah, it? Absolutely, it is. And I suppose what we really need is we, we need a system where you can do a test and have, an, have, have a result inside 15 minutes. Yes. And, you know, that's really a, I was talking with somebody the other day. And I think what needs to happen, and but it's like everything, it's a slow road, is that if you do a test and you're proved that you don't have it, well, then you should have the option of not wearing a mask yeah. because you have the test. Mm -hmm. And if you have to do a test every two weeks not to wear a mask, yeah. I mean, but people probably would say, OK, I'll do that. Now, here's the other thing that I think is going to become the next controversial topic is that when the vaccine comes in, you know, whenever they get it, I, for me, I'm hoping that there doesn't become this whole vaccine shaming where if some people don't agree with it and they say, I don't want a vaccine, I don't trust it, it's too, it's not, you know, had enough testing and so on, I don't want to take it. But then the government are saying, yeah, but if you don't take it, you can't join your gym, you can't send your kids to school, you can't uh, go in these, you know, community activities. And, you know, we could... We, we could have a situation in a few years where you have to carry a card that says you're vaccinated. And if you're not vaccinated, then you're excluded from things in the community or in life. Now, that would become very sad and, and the world would become a very locked down place. And, and those people who don't want to, it's like taking the vaccine for your children when they're small or anything. You say, I don't agree with it for this reason. I don't want to take it. So I'm hoping that doesn't happen. But all signs are pointing to that right now, which is a shame. I certainly hope not. That, that, that would not be good at all, you know. It'd be crazy. No, no, no. So come here. Let's let's move on. Just we're we're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna finish up pretty soon. But let's just tell me. Let you were saying there the time of the you know in the eighty nine when you were in the cellar and the sawdoxes were taken off and Leo I know is a friend of yours and you know you've lots of friends in the sawdoxes. What, what kind of music did you grow up listening to? Um, I suppose I should we were like. Shane McGowan and The Clash and I suppose we had you know the likes of Madness and the specials and all in as well and then we kind of started getting into the spring scene and you know you, you, I, the only music I, I never really got into was the kind of the 90s stuff I never really got that <laughs> You know, did you was, have a favourite band when you were like in your 20s and so was there one band that kind of was it for you yeah, I used, to, I used to. Well, I used to love listening to Bob Dylan. I used to love listening to Bob Dylan. But then again, we used to have, like, down the cellar, we used to play an awful lot of uh, Johnny Cash. And, like, that was like, that was like, you know, we were like in our 20s and we were listening to Johnny Cash. And, like, the, the, he'd be banging out Johnny Cash. And, and John Prine back in, we used to play John Prine back then. And nobody heard of John Prine back then, like, you know? No, no, no. Yeah, and now, now everybody knows him. And oh, yeah. And and did you uh, did you you know obviously with the tune bands kind of appearing on the scene and too much for the white man That's and the saw doctors yeah, yeah. and all, all, all Kniff and everything, you know you were around for a lot of that and and um, you know and, and that was a great time, no? Oh, sure, it was absolutely brilliant. And, you know, like up in the U club, there are the bands playing, and then down the scout hall, and it was brilliant. Like there was there were so many bands in tune back then. It was it was crazy. Like it was like. Shows it in Nashville, <laughs> different type music. <laughs> yeah, and and you know the it, it's a like, you know, obviously now times are different and it's harder for young bands and everything. But I mean, Tum is it has always been a great town and that there's always been great bands around and and there's um you know of course the soul actors are the main thing and you know lots of bands were probably trying to be the soul actors and there can only be one. Yeah. But the thing is. They're, you know, for such a small town, you know, I remember Overruled and so on. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, it's great. And all, all of these bands coming out. And um, it's uh, it's great to kind of see that it all was very local. You know, I remember uh, somebody put up something on Facebook recently about uh, talking about all the old clubs, you know, in Tume, the nightclubs, mm -hmm. the Kestrel. And, and, I, and, I, so, and I, I wrote down the Hermitage. I remember my first club I went in Tume was the Hermitage, yeah. the nightclub in the Hermitage. I remember it was, And yeah. I was, geez, I think, I think I was only 16 or something or 15. I was really young mm -hmm. and my sister snuck me in, you know, <laughs> and they used to go there. And that was, that was kind of just, before the sportsman's, the sportsman's was opening, I think, but it, the Hermitage was still going. Yeah. And um, 
it's mad because like you had the Hermitage, you had the Sportsman's, you had the Kestrel, you had, you know, yeah. there was so much, there was a great scene around. Wasn't oh, there? It was, for such a small town, there was a lot happening, like, you know, and, and plenty of live music yeah. was going on back then. It's all different now. It's plenty of live, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and just going back to the Saw Doctors, you know, when you were um, that time when the Saw Doctors were, you know, really doing well and, and, and they captured kind of the imagination of everyone in Ireland and everything. Did you kind of jump onto that? Did you ever kind of go and see them in other places and oh, tour around with them? I have, I've seen them in England, Scotland, um, yeah. Ireland, New York. Actually, I'll tell you a funny one about New York. Wow. I went to see them in New York in 2000. And let me see, what year was it? I'd say it was about 2010, I think it was, right? And um, I was talking to Leo on, on the phone before it went over, and he um, he, he said to me, um, I'll stick on the guest list there, he said, um, um, Hazard plus three, okay? So yeah, I I went over, and um, I was staying with Mary Quirk, and so it was Mary and myself, and Paul, you know, Donald, and someone else, I can't remember who the other person was now, but someone else, I live in New York from June. So we went down to the gig anyway, and I went to the door and I said, um, uh, it says Colin Farrell plus three. And the guy in the door said to me, uh, oh, yeah, he said, Here's, he said, are you on a hazard? And I said, yeah. He said, you're down twice. <laughs> so I had another, I had Colin Farrell plus three and I had hazard plus three, right? So I thought she'd give me them. Um, because there was loads of Yanks, there was there was loads of Yanks outside that they were trying to get tickets because there was all it was sold out like right. Yeah, and yeah. Was tout, there was touts outside selling tickets for crazy money like. So I went down and up to these few Yanks. I says, "Do you want to go to the gig?" And this, how much? I said, "Nothing." I said, "Here," and I get them the four tickets. <laughs> so they were they were, wow. they were over the moon. They couldn't believe it. Like they wanted to buy me a drink for the night and everything. <laughs> was it a thing? That time when you went, you know, and saw them in New York and different places, you know, for you, was it kind of a, a weird experience having known them from the streets of Tume and, you know, the local scene? It must, must have been weird. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great feeling when you're seeing, you're seeing so many people enjoying themselves and you're saying, right, these people are having a great time thanks to these lads up on the stage that, that are all Tume lads, you know. Yeah, it's absolutely it's, it's a brilliant buzz, an absolutely brilliant buzz, you know. Well, I mean, it's great. I think it's a great feeling. And, you know, like the problem is in Ireland, we we're you know we're proud people and everything, but you know we have this thing about sometimes the nation of begrudgers. You know, there's you know the the, the it's like when they used to the the joke and tell you you know the the fellas I got a new car and your man would say geez fair play to you and when he'd walk in he'd go fucking wank yeah, yeah, you know yeah, yeah. so it's this, it's this kind of thing if someone's doing well you tell them fair play to you but you're envious and jealous at the same time, but I mean with the saw doctors. I think it was great in the sense because whether you loved them or whether you hated them, the fact that they were just fellas that were hanging around the town and, you know, got started writing songs together and, you know, could have been playing in, in Hazard's Bar on the Saturday night doing a session and then three weeks later playing in New York for, you know, thousands of people. The fact is that they, you know, they, they brought a feeling of joy and people loved it. And it's great when you look at those lads and say, I know all of them personally and they're great boys and they're great guys and they, they're, you know, they're, they're making people happy, no? 100%, 100%. And like, I remember another time, I think it was 1991, they were playing in Manchester in, oh, I can't remember the name of the venue. And I said to um, Pat McNamara in Joan, um, I said, Pat, we'll, we'll go over to the Saw Doctors in Manchester uh, tomorrow night. Do you want to come? And he said, yeah. And so, and Johnny Mills. Oh, I told the boys I had tickets. I had no tickets at all. <laughs> and I collected the boys at six o'clock in the morning. I was driving and we drove over to Manchester and down to the venue. And my brother was working in a pub in Manchester at the time. And I still had no tickets. I said, How am I going to get in here? And just by luck, before the gig, Ollie Jennings was coming down the steps of the fire escape on the side of the building. And I shouted at Ollie from outside the fence to come over. I should he gave us the three tickets to win. I mean, that's the gamble I took. Like I just drove over with no tickets. I told the boys I had tickets, and we had a great, we had a great night there too. It was brilliant, it was brilliant, brilliant. But but that but that, but that's great. I mean, that's great. You know, and they, they're the kind of fun times you have yeah. and the adventures. You know, mm -hmm. and and um, like now 
do you find, you know, you're in the UK and everything, do you listen to different music now or do you still listen to the same? I would, a day wouldn't pass where I'd listen to at least one song after song. But then again, having said that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But a day wouldn't pass that I wouldn't listen to a John Prine song either. I listen to John Prine every day as well. And yeah. they're two completely different types of And you know, you, yeah. And you said there about Dylan. Did, did, like, do you think for you, is Dylan a song, a songwriter or a poet? Which do you think? Well, he's both really, isn't he? <laughs> you know, he's both without a doubt. He's both. Yeah. Oh, he's both. Like, what, the reason I say it is because he is both for sure. You know, he's a musician, singer, songwriter, and a poet, but some people see it more as poetry in music, and some people see it the other way. So, yeah, you know. Well, that'd be like uh, Leonard Cohen, like Leonard Cohen, if it means a poet, like, you know. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Of course. And I mean, even Phil Linnett. Some people say Phil Linnett, you know, was the best Irish poet ever. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's how you look at these things. And can I ask you, you're in in the UK now. Do you find a huge difference in the English music scene as opposed to the Irish music scene? Um, Well, that's a tough one to answer. I'll tell you why, because I don't don't listen to, I I never listen to radio radio music. I never listen to, say, I don't turn on a radio station to listen to music because I cannot stand if a song comes on that I don't want to hear. So I just strictly listen, to, I, I listen to either Spotify or YouTube music. I select my own music. So I don't really know. You you, you make your own playlist. Yeah, so I, I would never, in, in my years here, I would never turn on a radio station with, with the music on it. I just don't. So I, I, I honestly don't know what the music yeah, is yeah. here. That sounds daft, but that's the truth. You know? Yeah. No, but, but but I mean I mean more so like as in live gigs and stuff. Before now the coronavirus, did you is there many live gigs around Warrington, for example, or is it completely different? We Maria myself, Maria's a massive fan of Paul Heaton. So we've gone to see Paul Heaton and Jack and Habit Jack. Okay. Habit. Wow, yeah, yeah, we've, yeah. We've gone to see them. Like, is Paul, Paul Heaton is from around is he around that area? Where's he from? I think he's from Hull, I think. I think he's from the northeast from Hull, I think. Oh he's from Hull, okay, yeah. yeah. If Maria yeah. there, she yeah. that question straight away, but um, we've gone to see them a couple of times. We've gone to see Bruce Springsteen in, in the beautiful. Is, 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 it just, is it the beautiful South Dale or is it just Paul Heaton? Paul Heaton and Jackie Abbott. It's Paul, oh yeah, she was the girl yeah. from the beautiful South. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a great, they're a great combination. We've gone to see them a couple of times. We've gone to see Bruce Springsteen in, in Manchester or in yeah Manchester about three four years ago. We've gone, we went to see John Prine in Manchester about three years ago. Um, yeah, we've we've seen. A few, I suppose, a few old bands down the Irish club in that time. <laughs> Small bands, you know. Ah, cool. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Mm-hmm. So, so listen. Uh, do you do you ever see yourself going home to Ireland, or is England the home for you now? I know Ireland will always be home to me. Like I still don't call England home. I suppose it's like you know. It reminds me. I, I give an example. It reminds me of my mother. Right, my mother is living in Chum since nineteen fifty whatever, but she still calls Kilkenny home. So. She does, and like, her, like say her her sister. It's only a stone throw. Yeah, her sister in law still lives in it lives in in the house where my mother grew up, and uh, my mother might go out there visiting, and she say to us, "I'm going out home now for a few hours." Do you know what I mean? She still calls it home. So, what do you miss from Ireland or from June? What do you miss? It's, I suppose it's, it's most of the time it wouldn't even into your head, but you, of course you have times when you're not at home. You miss family. Uh, the most important thing is. You know, like, oh, I'd love, love you at home. I was, you know, with the family back, you know. Um, but then again, you see, again, as I said earlier on, travel is so easy, you know. Like, living in, 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 in Manchester, um, I'm in from June, it's not much different than living in Dublin, I'm in from June. It's mm, like, like, the same kind of distance. Well, well yeah. Like, yeah, I, no, it is. It's the same kind of distance, yeah. Like, I could jump, I could jump on a plane tomorrow morning and be, be in June. I could jump on a plane and say, Man- Manchester Airport is 15 minutes away from me. Or Liverpool Airport, the same thing. And I could leave here at nine o'clock and I could be sitting in Bellingham Road in June at half eleven. You know, two and a half hours from, from here to the house in June. Yeah, and you know, because obviously you, you know, you, you were before the COVID thing, you were back in Tume a lot. But do you feel now Tume has changed a lot to how it was 10 years ago and stuff? Do you feel it's very different? Oh, absolutely, yeah. As, as regards, um, well, especially, um, I wouldn't know as many, many people in Tume now. But I think even if I was living in Chum, that would still be the case. It's just, it's not the fact that I'm not living in Chum, it's the fact that so many more people have moved into Chum. You know, the, 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 there's more people in Chum. And I suppose the fact that I'm not in the pub scene now as well, when you're in the pub scene, you do tend to know more people anyway. You know, 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, I have this thing sometimes when I go back to Tume and it's more, for example, you know, for, for, for 10 years, I was teaching guitar in Tume and, and, you know, you'd have all sorts of ages. And now the thing is, I'll be walking down the street and someone will say, how are you, Simon? How are you? And I'll be looking at them and I'll think, I don't know this person at all. And then I, I kind of, there's something in their eye or something in their expression. And I go, I don't know them, but there's something about them. And I'd be like, how, how's it going? And, and not alone will I, you know that if you meet someone, you know the face. But then I realize Jeez, I think I taught this fellow guitar 10 years ago or something. And you realize that he, he was maybe nine years old and now he's 19. And so I get that a lot when I go home. I get people saying to me, how are you? And, and I'm thinking, Jesus, how do I know this fellow? And I say, how, how, what's your name again? And they say, oh, I'm Paul. We used to teach me guitar. And I'd be like, Jesus. And that's the hardest thing when you meet young people that have grown up because they're totally different. Absolutely, yeah. yeah I, I suppose I'd, I'd see a lot of that too with my own um, what said young lads would have been friends of my young lads growing up and now they're adults and so just who the fuck is that lad like <laughs> and he knows me well and my son would say to me that's John that's John such a person you not know him I go oh yeah yeah I know him yeah. it's a funny thing isn't it because kids you know when when kids start to get to know you you don't change your appearance yeah, that much yeah. but when adults look at kids their appearance changes a lot in 10 years no yeah, 100% for yeah. sure yeah, yeah 100% here's kind of the last few questions for you but if you could change something from your past what would it be and and do you have any regrets at all about like you know things in your life so far right well um this is not a short answer but i have always said and i still say it never regret anything you've done in your past I wouldn't change one thing for the world. Um, would would I like to start all over again? I would, but not, that doesn't mean I would change anything. I I like I I love life. I absolutely love life. So would I love to be twenty again? I'd love to be twenty again. Absolutely. Some people say, "Why would you love to be twenty again?" And I thought, oh, "Fucking hell, give me twenty all over again." I, you know, as you get older, like 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 I'm fifty four now. Like I've only. 16 years to go and I'm 70 if I live that long 70 like I don't want to be 70 but I hope I live to be 70 no I know I know I yeah know. Yeah, yeah 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 it, it's a race to the, it's a race to the end that we have to finish isn't it well you I know? did like so but as regrets no, I wouldn't regret a thing and I have done some of the most daftest stupidest things anyone could ever do in life believe me made a lot of mistakes in life but that doesn't mean I have to regret what I don't know there's no point in regretting any of it because you're not going to achieve anything you can look back and you can laugh and you can say, oh, I did that stupid thing or I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have done that. But there's nothing you can do about it, you know. And even if you had a time machine and you could go back, it doesn't mean it would make it any better or worse, does it, you know? Show me a man that, show me a man that hasn't made a mistake in life. Like, I mean, like, everybody makes mistakes. Of course, of course, of course. What, what's, the, what's the best compliment you've ever received? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't know. I, geez, that's 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 what I landed on me. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, had some, had somebody said something to you once that you go, "Jesus, I never thought about that," but thanks very much. I I never looked at it that way. You know, has like whether it's been to do with your walk and your charity work or just you know anything you've done, has somebody ever surprised you with like some kind of thing that they thought about you? Well, look at okay. <sighs> Without, obviously, I can't reveal names here, but um, there were situations um, where um, people that were in suicidal situations that we helped out and a person would have contacted me some months down the road to say, thanks, you saved my life, okay? Now, I wouldn't have looked upon it that way, but, yeah, that has happened where pe people have read, rang me sometime later and, and they said, you know, thanks so much for what you've done for me, Um and that you couldn't get a better compliment than that because you know that that, that that they mean it and you know that they're alive today and they may not have been alive if they hadn't made contact in the first place. No, that's no better compliment, Colin, because, you know, com compliments about your appearance or, you know, how much money you have or how good you are at a sport, I mean, they're only, they're only fleeting, you know. The thing is, when you look back and you can say, somebody says to you, you know, you changed my life for the better, you helped me survive. You did this. I mean, they're the best compliments you can ever get. You know, not all heroes wear capes. It's, it's, you know it, what I mean. It's, 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 it, it's a lovely feeling. Um, you know, sometimes people ask me like, "Well, do you not get fucking depressed yourself with all this stuff, right?" 
And when you, the thing, the thing that keeps you going is when when you know somebody hasn't taken their own life because they've sought the help. But that that's like that's like winning the lottery. Like it's better to win the lottery because you know that somebody's now in in in, in a much better place and and they're you know looking forward to a better life and a you know that that that, that that's better than anything. No, that's great. And and Colin, la- last question for you, right? Mm-hmm. What are your aspirations and ambitions for the future? Do you know what I? All I want to do is continue doing what I'm doing. Um, no plans to make this into a big, massive organization. Um, I just want to keep tipping away nicely. Um, you know, helping people on a daily basis. Um, I'm happy to do that, really, and have a few pints. Yes, have a few pints, but I feel like a few pints. Hopefully, stay off the fags and continue on this faith and thing I'm on. But <laughs> I haven't. I'm off. The- and stay healthy. That's the thing. But you know, uh, th- there's one thing, obviously, just to avoid confusion, because obviously we said stamp out suicide is in the UK and and the, the Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, England. So obviously, anybody listening to this. Where would you point them? In what direction? Because you know, we we, we they they can't call the stamp out suicide line, or or maybe they can. I don't know. So what I'm what I'm, if 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 anybody listening to this um, is in any way feeling suicidal, they can contact us on zero seven seven six six eight zero eight two two two. Um, they can send us a text message and we call them back, or they can call. Most people prefer to send us a text message. And we'll contact them. Um, they can also go on our website, which is www.stampoutsuicide.co.uk. Um, and they can make contact with us that way as well. But I just, you know, for anyone that's having any sort of thoughts of suicide or afraid for their own safety, don't be afraid to get in contact because we we we, we will help. We won't judge you, you know. So it's 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 yeah, right. So most people find it. They find that we make the contact that it's it's a massive um, weight off their shoulders just to make the contact with us. Is that when you say that number, do they have to put an English code before that, or is that the number? No, that's the number. That, that, that anyone in the UK will will, will um, just call that number zero seven seven six six eight zero eight two two two. Um, that's so, so if you call that number for, direct from Ireland, it'll get you through straight through, will it? No, no, no. It's 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 oh, it will from Northern Ireland, yeah, not from the Republic. Uh, we're we're not we're not we're not registered in the Republic of Ireland at all. Um, you you have to um, you have to um, register as a different charity in the Republic of Ireland. Now, having said that, um, we we do have people in the Republic of Ireland. We would never turn anyone away. So, if somebody did contact us, um, we would organise. We would definitely, most definitely, organise um, for support. Be it through someone here or through someone in the Republic, we, without a doubt, like I mean, and we have done in the past, and we will continue to do that. We'll always. Is it something that in the future you hope to be in Ireland? It's not. It's not in our plans, but that's not to say it wouldn't happen. We have. We haven't. Right. We haven't right. made any plans to um, to um, open it up in Ireland, uh, but that's not to say it wouldn't happen, Simon. But again, as I said, we, yeah, the, the, we still do. We still do. Um, help people in, in, in the Republic if if they were to make contact with us, you know, we would never turn anyone away. You know, there's always a way like yeah. you know, especially with technology today, I mean like, you know, we can do stuff through WhatsApp and all that as well, you know. Yeah. And and tell us so so let's say okay, obviously that's you know, if if that helps people with the number. But what what for anybody listening obviously in, in, in Ireland then who who would you suggest they call then in the in Ireland? Like if they're you know, if they, is it Pieta House or who well, is now it's, the, it's, the it's, main it's, one? It seems Pieta House are the National uh, Suicide Prevention Service now because um, when when Consol got shut down and um, all the government funding, as far as I'm aware, was transferred from Consol over to Pieta House. So I would imagine that Pieta House are now the national uh, organisation um, in suicide prevention. Yeah, and, and the Samaritans? Are, are, is, are the Samaritans, Samaritans still going with, oh, you know, suicide Samaritans are, but the, the thing about the Samaritans um, is if somebody's looking for counselling, um, the Samaritans don't provide counselling. The, the Samaritans are there to listen to you, um, which is brilliant. The Samaritans are a fantastic organisation. Um, but if somebody was thinking in the lines of counselling, unless things have changed in Ireland since I was there, but um, as far as I'm aware, 
you, they don't provide counselling, they provide a listening service. But either yeah. or either... Well, I mean, that's great. I, th- that's great because I just, you know, it would be obviously, you know, it, it would be a shame for us to do this show and not put all the details there for, oh, you know, Irish yeah. people, English people, everybody. Yeah, I would like then, again, like, if there's, again, if, if there's other organisations as well in Ireland, like, I mean, like, say, down in the southeast there, like, there's a fantastic organisation um, called the Talk to Tom Foundation, uh, it was run by Ray Cullen down in Corey in County Wexford, and they, they're a fantastic organisation, like, <coughs> it's called Talk to Tom. You know, if you have any, you might have listeners from that part of the country that, you know, that can contact Talk to Tom for support. Well, you know, what I'm going to do is, you know, I'm going to put any of those links, uh, uh, all those links yeah. we feel are helpful, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, that's it. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. But I want to thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And, you know, you have some really valuable insights into it and experiences. And I really hope it will help people. And I hope anybody who's contemplating anything that's detrimental to their well-being. I hope they think about it and they take the time to talk to somebody. And I hope you've kind of helped them, pointing them in the right road, you know, and and I really want to thank you for that. And as I said, if anyone has been affected by today's topics and needs someone to talk to, I will put all relevant links to in the information section when I when the podcast goes out on the air and we'll put, you know, stamp out suicide, that talk to Tom, everything, that Samaritans, we'll put all those links. So you'll have a, a good choice and hopefully someone can help you. And thank you, Colm. And I want to say thanks for making a difference. You know, I, I really want to have people on the show that make a difference. And for me, I've always in the back of my mind thought, you know, Colm Farrell is a great man. He makes a difference to not just the people of Tune, but the people of Ireland and the UK. And, you know, I want to say thank you for me and everybody else. You you know, as I said a minute ago, not all heroes wear capes. So <laughs> we're proud of you and you've done, you've done a great job, uh, you know. Thanks, thanks, William Simon. We'll appreciate it. Well done. And, and, you know, we'll spread the word and get this out information out there so people can have a better understanding. So thank you, Colm. Have a nice weekend. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And, uh, and hopefully we'll see you in some for a pint from the... We'll see you for a pint yeah. in June one Definitely. evening, yeah, when things get better, <laughs> yes. rather than these virtual drinks, you know. Uh, thanks a lot, and take care, everybody, and have a good night. Yes, Simon. Mind yourself. Take care. Goodbye, Colin. Bye. Okay, on next week's show, we'll be talking to Maeve Kelly from Kinvara. Maeve is a musician, she plays with the band Fling, and we'll be talking to her about her new Irish Whiskey Stone Company, um, and lots about her life and everything she's done so far. And we'll play some music maybe too, who knows. Okay, thank you folks, good night. <laughs>